back to Dreams, Passion and Your Hong Kong Story where every time we bring before you inspirational stories from Hong Kong. Today we have with us the privilege of having one of Hong Kong's most regarded philanthropist, James Chen. Hello James and welcome to our show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on your show. So James is a very active proponent of the concept of catalytic philanthropy. This is a term that's used to denote all those philanthropists who play a very structured and active role in tackling some of the pressing problems of the world. And the problem that James has been tackling for the last 20 years in his life, for which he's super passionate about, is providing a better vision to many in the world who are deprived of it. And in pursuit of this passion, James has founded Clearly, which is a global campaign launched to provide better eye care service to 2.5 billion people in this world. James is also co-founder of Ad Lens, which is a variable lens company. James is trustee and founder of Vision for Nation, which is an award-winning charity that actually promotes healthy eyesight and care facilities to many in this world, and especially focused on Rwanda. Nearly 12.5 million Rwandians have benefited from this charity project of James. James is also chairman of Wahum Group Holdings and part of his family foundation Chen Yet Sen, which is very focused on early childhood literacy. And Chen Yet Sen Foundation has actually served more than 200 projects in China and Hong Kong. James and his wife Sue together have also founded an NGO in Hong Kong called Bring Me a Book Foundation. Let's talk to James and find out what role has Hong Kong played in the life of his entrepreneur and philanthropist? Okay, James, tell us a little bit about your early days in Hong Kong, growing up as a child, and what inspired you to get into philanthropy? Okay, so I was actually born in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but left at the age of three uh, and uh, moved to uh, Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. Okay. And so I actually grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and then uh, to the UK uh, for schooling, as well as the, the US, mm -hmm. where I spent 15 years before coming back to Hong Kong okay. in 1988. Mm -hmm. But what, what exactly motivated you to get into philanthropy? It's actually, I'm following along uh, my father's footsteps, my late father's footsteps. Uh -huh. uh, actually, my, my grandfather had already uh, 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 been a very philanthropic uh, uh, individual, uh, uh, helping to fund uh, a local school here uh, many decades ago. Mm -hmm. And when my father retired uh, from business, he, uh, his, hope, his passion was to go back to his home village, uh, which is near Shanghai, uh, where he actually uh, uh, experienced famine as a child. And so it was desperately poor area, and he felt like that now that he'd made it, uh, uh, that he wanted to give back to his hometown. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, did many things that many of his peers did, uh, which is, you know, build schools and, uh, and a hospital and other public works. Mm -hmm. um, but what was different about him, his philanthropy, was that he actually, other than writing checks, he actually was very, very engaged and involved right. in all the projects uh, that he did for his hometown. And I think that is the inspiration for my philanthropy and the way that, that, uh, that I've approached the uh, issue of, of philanthropy. So, James, you know, as part of your catalytic philanthropy, you, of course, someone who's very hands-on and very actively involved, yes. uh, uh, you know, in all the foundations that you're part of. Yeah. And the subject that you picked up is poor vision. Yeah. So what made you choose that topic? We were the family foundation. We were doing all this wonderful work wow. in China and Hong Kong. I came across this uh, Oxford University physics professor mm -hmm. who had invented this adjustable powered lens technology. Okay. And so that instantly kind of set a light bulb in my head. I guess because um, that uh, experience uh, growing up in Africa and then in my adult life uh, uh, working in you know, developing parts of Asia and, 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 and Africa, that, uh, that really got me uh, uh, thinking because uh, I've needed glasses since I've been a teenager and uh, notice how come you know, so few people in the developing world wear glasses? Is it because they don't need glasses 
or because they do not have access. Now, of course, I know the answer. It's right. that they don't have access. So I'm a co-founder of AdLens, and 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 uh, we. The, the, so my journey on vision uh -huh. uh, really started with 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 coming across the professor. We started the company to develop this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, and from the beginning, the idea was it was a commercial as well as a philanthropic an endeavor. Um, uh, we what we quickly found out was, you know, that uh, it really needed to be two separate. Tracks, so so that's how you know. While AdLens continues today, uh, working on the technology and uh, and uh, a fascinating journey right. on the commercial side, uh, uh, you know, I've uh, also you know had this amazing journey, uh, really understanding the issue of access to vision correction. So clearly global, which is yeah. your global awareness campaign that yes. you run. So tell us something about it. You know, what does it do, and you know, what have, what inspired you to start Clearly Global? Well, well, I, to to answer that question, maybe I'll just take a step back and talk about Vision for a Nation because, okay. you know, you know, when we had the, the the glasses technology, I thought, okay, this is something that can help to solve the problem. What I realized was that was, this problem was much more complicated, right? And uh, and so uh, uh, we needed to get to the bottom of. Why, for example, the, the de developing, uh, the, the aid agencies that work in the developing world, as well as eye care professionals, all said, no, 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 it can't be done. You know, you can't get, you know, eye care and glasses to people the, at the bottom of the pyramid, right. essentially, right? And that somehow that didn't sit with me. And so my team and I, we brainstormed and said, you know what, let's just figure it out for ourselves. We'll pick a country. We'll try and do it, and if we fail, we will at least learn why this won't work. Because nothing we were being told, you know, while they said no, nobody could tell me why exactly it should be no, right? And so, so we 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 started Vision for a Nation, went to Rwanda, and uh, and to to cut a long story short, what people said we couldn't do, we did, which is to bring uh, access to vision correction to the entire. A nation of Rwanda, right? And the learning from that uh, experience was that it's doable. Like we 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 helped to create a new model that could reach everyone in the country, right? right? And and the the what we discovered was that you know the the medical community, the professional community, what they're always trying to do is look for the perfect solution. So when you go to a, an eye doctor in the developed world in a city like Hong Kong, you know, they'll give you a perfect prescription, yes. right? But uh, in the developing world, you know, what you have to do is find a good enough solution right. for functional vision, right? Yes. And so we could train nurses in three days to do a good enough screening yes. to be able to dispense glasses. And, uh, and then we sent all these nurses we trained to every one of the 15,000 villages in Rwanda. And we, in, in, by the end of our program uh, uh, in 2017, we had screened over 2.5 million of the 12.5 million Rwandans. And, uh, and we then, after we had gone to every village, we then gave the program back to the government uh, and they continue to run the program today. How was the response of the public, uh, you know, to, to what you were doing and to what your company was doing? I mean, because this this is just a phenomenal work coming from a you know uh, from a philanthropist. Uh, no, I, I we again we were very lucky to be able to find a local champion uh, who um, at the time we met her, she was the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health. She then, lucky for us, got per, uh, promoted to Minister of Health. And she was really our partner and champion. Uh, and through that access, we were able to get lots of things done quickly. We we probably still have could have done this, but it would, would right. have been a lot more pain. It was a, quite a painful journey, as you can imagine. Okay. But uh, it would have been a lot more painful, taken a lot more time, if not for for her help and and for her guidance in how to do things in Rwanda to be effective, right? And so we were very, very lucky to have her champion our cause uh, uh, and uh, and it's a uh, it's something that I, I, I uh, it's a it's a big lesson to learn that you know when you have whatever ideas you really need to work with local champions right. you got to work with you know stakeholders who have 
skin in the game, right. and you know, particularly governments when you're trying to deal with these kind of issues. So Vision for Nation addressed uh, you know, vision correction in a country like Rwanda, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you are still working in many other countries with this uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. No, actually, we, we only, at that point, we were f single-mindedly focused on trying to solve the problem in one country, really? in Rwanda. So Vision for a Nation now is working in Ghana, okay. the, the next country, right? And, um, and Vision for a Nation is, is planning to also now to start a program uh, somewhere in Asia. You know, of course, that, that's been a bit sidelined by uh, what's going on this year with COVID. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, the, the issue coming out of Rwanda was, wow, okay, we did it. And uh, we want to scale this up, but we also realize that with one organization, with the resources, you know, we have a small team, we would not be able to solve this problem globally, right? right? If we did it by ourselves, it would take over a thousand years, one country at a time. Right. Uh, and so, you know, and so that's why it's, you know, that we did some more brainstorming, said you've got to kind of again think out of the box right and did that lead to clearly yeah and so that's what led to clearly ah. you know and, and that's the my approach and what you know now you know i've coined this phrase called moonshot philanthropy right you want to do something that is you know shoot for the moon right moonshot philanthropy. yeah yeah and and uh, and and it's a it's a kind of philanthropy which is about actually solving problems you know much of philanthropy you know people are you know engage in it really to uh to, to, it's feel good. I call yeah. it feel good philanthropy and sp solving problem philanthropy. Right? right. We need to take more risk as philanthropists, right, right. right? And try things that that never been tried that people say can't be done. Right. And then prove them. And oftentimes, you know, there's lots of setbacks and failures along the way, right. along the journey. The philanthropist, then, like myself, you know, we we develop a domain expertise in that particular issue. And it's that journey and the and the uh, domain expertise that allows you to make progress towards solving these issues. And so, for me, for example, AdLens is a milestone. Uh, a vision for a nation is a milestone, and clearly has become a milestone. The idea was, you know, we're not going to be able to do this by ourselves, right? So, hey, maybe what we should do is to advocate for this issue. It's an issue that the literally the world forgot. So clearly it's very much about about advocacy, right? It's about trying to uh, let the particularly the world's policy makers and government leaders know that you know this is an issue that can be solved. Okay. But more than that, that this is an issue that has a huge impact on the country. Right. You know, it's not just about solving a health issue, right? Because vision, poor vision would fall under the health silo, right. but as a as a as a as an issue this in is the a health silo. Issue, basically. Yeah, by 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 correcting vision, right? What we realized, and and the timing of the clearly campaign was was that the world, you know, through the UN, had committed to the Sustainable Development Goal, seventeen Sustainable Development Goals, and so we uh, leveraged that by saying, wait a minute, you've committed to solving these you know 17 SDGs but you know what you're not going to be able to solve at least six of those SDGs if a third of the world cannot see clearly right, right. when they have blurry vision it will impact their educational outcomes uh, their productivity you know uh, and and many other things right so that some of them not even uh, in the SDGs like driver safety right one of the large which is by the way uh, 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 road traffic accident is the largest killer of uh, of people under 30 years old in Africa and and rapidly you know the same issue in the rest of the world right yeah. uh, in places for example like India yeah. and so having you know correcting this issue of of vision so yes it helps to, it, we call it the golden thread to so, achieving so, the so SDGs. clearly does that advocate uh, so that does the advocacy of clearly uh, is more towards the government and the policymakers. Yes, and very how do you, much. What so. exactly do you do that? What are the exact like steps for that? We were very lucky. The, the early success we had uh, was to 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 get the, uh, uh, the the Commonwealth heads of government. So fifty three governments in the Commonwealth, you know, in their meeting in London in twenty eighteen, 
we managed to get this issue onto a commitment from them to solve this issue, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a big win from us. Yeah. And, uh, and from that, we were then able to go to the United Nations mm -hmm. in New York, and uh, we formed a group called Friends of Vision at the UN, yes. and which today now uh, we are working on a resolution at the UN uh, to recognize this issue of poor vision as a precursor, as, a, as, as almost a basic human right. That right. So James, as part of your Chen Yat-sen Foundation, you, you, and, you, know, you and your family, you're also really active in tackling a lot of uh, literacy issues, and especially yes. at the child literacy issues. Um, also, your recent, you know, your, the, the foundation that you run in Hong Kong, Bring Me a Book, focuses on family literacy. That's right. Can you can you tell us what inspired you to get into that, and what are the different initiatives that you do as part of that? So it's it's actually in the same vein. It's this is, you know, when I reflect on that, this uh, I I think is for our family is is the other moonshot philanthropy project, uh, and and that again came about because very much it resonated uh, with uh, myself and my, and my wife because uh, we, we had very young children at the time. This was, you know, my, my eldest, as you've met, is, uh, he's 20 years old yes. now. Uh, but uh, when he was very young, you know, I remember when my wife and I would travel to places like Taipei or Singapore or Kuala Lumpur, the, one of the first places she would head for is the local bookstore and she'd be looking for you know, children's picture books, uh, that, you know, in Chinese for, 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 for our son then. And, uh, and she would always kind of feed back to me like, wow, you know, compared to the to English language, you know, the, 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 the variety and quality of these Chinese picture books are really bad, you know. And, and that's kind of something that stuck in my mind. Uh, we, we decided to, to, to start with with Bring Me a Book in Hong Kong, which is actually, uh, we, we licensed that for, uh, concept from uh, Bring Me a Book California, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, uh, and when we started uh, doing it in Hong Kong, uh, uh, you know, it was very much, I think, parents, you know, this is, we're talking about you know, almost 20 years ago, right. you know, parents were very much, yeah, yeah, of course we want our children to read, but in their minds, they want children to read uh, about, um, about uh, you know to be better at school, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas our emphasis is, is about the enjoyment of reading, the importance and enjoyment of reading for right. children, right. to develop this lifelong habit of reading. Right. So James, you are you know a Hong Konger, um, of course, who splits his time between different countries, but yes. essentially uh, you know come from Hong Kong, yeah. and you are. Uh, doing incredible work for the rest of the world um, in field of eye care and also in fields of literacy. How has Hong Kong been for your professional journey? I mean, does coming from Hong Kong help you uh, in reach, reaching all your uh, goals and passion uh, in other places of the world? Well, I feel very lucky to, you know, to 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 have been born in Hong Kong, to 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 base myself and my family in Hong Kong, because it's really one of the most you know, I, you know, it's uh, it's built itself as Asia's world city, and I think, you know, on many aspects, I think that is right. Uh, you know, I, I rank it. You know, we spend time in in the UK, so Hong Kong ranks with London and New York, I think, as a world city, right? And so, uh, to be to have a base in one of these cities is a is definitely a plus. So, as a philanthropist. What are some of the challenges that you faced when you decided to pursue this mission of uh, vision correction or this mission of uh, attaining early childhood literacy? The, 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 the challenge is to how do you become, you know, effective, right, uh, in, in whatever uh, issue you choose. These are very, very difficult uh, challenges. Uh, that require domain expertise. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to go up this learning curve to be able to then make judgments about, you know, what works and what doesn't work, right? Uh, and 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 help to build this model for yourself about how do I move this issue forward? Right. And if you're lucky along the way, you achieve milestones. And, right. and I feel very blessed to have achieved, for example, a few milestones at least in my vision journey with Vision for a Nation and now clearly. Um, and But of course, the, the journey's not over. Wonderful. So are you ready for a rapid fire question now? I'll try. 
That's getting to know James Hong Kong story in a bit more fun way. All right. So if you were not a philanthropist, what would you have been? Well, I actually have a day job, which is to run running my family off family's family office. So in the in the investment business, right? Okay. And I find a lot of uh, challenge and meaning in that. So I'm very lucky to have. You know, okay. Your favorite way to hang out with friends and family in Hong Kong? Uh, hiking. You know, we, uh, my family and I, you know, we, we've been big hikers, uh, uh, you know, pre-COVID. Okay. But Do certainly, you have a particular hike you're really fond of? Well, certainly, uh, we're very lucky behind where we are. We have the reservoirs, Tai Tam Reservoir, right. and there's some lovely hikes there. Uh, but uh, Dragon's Back is, okay. is, is, of course, a very stunning one. And I have a, a, a group that uh, every Sunday does the Twin Peaks, right? Twin Peaks, that's yeah. an intense one. That is that is an intense <laughs> one. And So your favorite uh, dining option in Hong Kong, both casual and formal? Well, that's an easy question for me, Seva. Both it covers casual, both, of course. Yeah, of course. I thought Seva is a more formal place. No, it isn't. It's because it it serves comfort food, really. Okay. So you know, I mean, what I see is uh, like my kids love it. My my what mom kind loves of it. What cuisine does Seva offer? So Seva, you know, offers. Uh, it's a uniquely Hong Kong institution, right? There's no other Sevas anywhere in the world, okay. and um, uh, it serves a mixture of uh, 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 Western, you know, with Chinese, Hong Kong favorites, and even Indian. Okay. Right. So, yes, and a very Seba. interesting, yeah, it's an interesting mix of of cuisines, right? Okay. And, and I think that's why it's a, in, and in in some ways, Seva encapsulates, you know, the uniqueness of Hong Kong. Okay. You know? Your idea of romantic date in Hong Kong. Wow. <laughs> I have to ask my wife that one. <laughs> For my wife and I, you know. Uh, a hike like we used to live in near the peak uh, and so a Lugard Road uh, hike is just one of the most particularly in the evenings okay. is absolutely stunning right okay. and I, I think it's you know on a nice night it's really super romantic too so. okay all right last time you did something for the first time in Hong Kong right now you know to have been able to spend you know several months in Hong Kong without leaving the city this is a truly unique experience for me and I'm really loving it okay. to uh, to be able to be here and not, not, not move and, and really getting to know more and more of, of Hong Kong. Right? Okay. And three words that describes your Hong Kong life. Wow. So three words to describe my Hong Kong life. It's incredibly vibrant. Uh, it's safe. And I feel that, uh, you know, I, it's a privilege to be in Hong Kong. Okay. What are you most proud of as a Hong Konger? Well, I'm most proud of Hong Kong. I think over the last, uh, you know, year, 18 months, uh, we've seen so much happen locally and within the world, you know. And the thing that strikes me is that with, you know, the civility of the people of Hong Kong, even in, you know, in these very difficult times last year in the demonstrations, people on the, for the most part, were extremely civil, you know. And, uh, and certainly, uh, uh, this year with COVID, you know, and, and people really, you know, you know, putting on their masks and, and social distancing, doing all this, it's, uh, it's, it strikes me the word that comes to mind is civility. Right. And as a business leader, what would you advise the global business leaders and policy makers, you know, uh, why should they be investing with Hong Kong? You know, uh, I think that Hong Kong for so long has been kind of the window of the world into China mm -hmm. and and more recent times kind of window uh, for China into the world right? right and and frankly I think that that continues you know despite all the challenges we're facing you know there's still the need in the world to to you know understand to interact in the way that needs to you know Hong Kong forms a, is a great kind of gateway to that, mm -hmm. and similarly, I think for 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 the Chinese, you know, uh, to to understand how to engage with the world, Hong Kong has a lot to offer. Okay. Well, thank you so much, James, for coming to our show, and we wish you all the very best in all your future endeavors. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Stay tuned.
tuned for our next episode on Dreams, Passion and Your Hong Kong Story where we shall bring you yet another fascinating story from this amazing land, Hong Kong. Thank you.